Being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them, the kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed, nor will they say, look, here it is, or there, for behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. And he said to the disciples, the days are coming when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not see it. And they will say to you, look there, or look here. Do not go out or follow them. For as the lightning flashes and lights up the sky from one side to the other, so will the Son of Man be in his day. But first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating and drinking and marrying and being given in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, just as it was in the days of Lot, they were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But on the day when Lot went out from Sodom, fire and sulfur rained from heaven and destroyed them all. So it will be on the day when the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, let the one who is on the housetop with his goods in the house not come down to take them away. And likewise, let the one who is in the field not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever seeks to preserve his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life will keep it. I tell you, in the night there will be two in one bed. One will be taken and the other left. There will be two women grinding together. One will be taken and the other left. And they said to him, Where, Lord? He said to them, Where the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. This morning, we have chosen a word that isn't very well known to many of us. It's the word kingdom. Kingdom. It's a word that is, appears in the Bible, I think, somewhere between four and 500 times. In the New Testament, almost 300 times. Uh, and, and we struggle with this word as American Christians because, let's face it, our national heritage is not uh, exactly friendly towards kings and kingdoms, right? I mean, we, we threw it off and we don't have much use for it unless it's ceremonial. And even then, most of us look at it and say, that's a lot of money you spend on that, you know? And, and uh, we, we like our independence, right? And so we have a difficulty understanding this idea of a kingdom, the kingdom concept that's throughout Scripture and yet the entire storyline of the Bible revolves around this. And it's, it's how God reveals himself in the scriptures. You know, beginning in the Old Testament, God, you know, just puts before us that he is the king. He is the ruler of everything that is. Everything on this planet, everything in this universe, it belongs to him. It's part of his kingdom. It's under his sovereign rule, right? To the psalmist, God says, for kingship belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. Through the, the heathen emperor, Nebuchadnezzar, who at the time was the, the mightiest emperor uh, alive, part of the Babylonian empire, right? Uh, God speaking through this man says his dominion is an everlasting dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, and he does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? In the Old Testament, God declared that he would rule his kingdom absolutely that he would address the sin of humanity and the consequences upon creation that it's brought about by placing his chosen king, the Messiah, in charge of his kingdom. He declared that that Messiah would come through the family line of the Israelite, great, great Israelite king, David. That this Messiah would bring about forgiveness for the sins of his people and that ultimately, he would usher in a golden age of blessing that would extend throughout all of eternity. So the idea of the kingdom is actually at the very heart of the gospel message of Jesus Christ. So much so that in the New Testament, you will see it as the gospel of the kingdom of God or the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. When Jesus began his ministry in Mark chapter 1, at the very beginning of this ministry, after John the Baptist was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. The very word gospel 
has as part of its etymology and, it, and its meaning this idea of kingdom. You see, in the ancient world, in the Greek world, the, the word is euangelion, which we get the word gospel. And an euangelion was a good news proclamation that came from the king or from the emperor. I'll give me an example. How many of you guys have been watching the Olympics this last week or two, okay? They just had the marathon, and, and I know a lot of you like to run, and you've run half marathons or full marathons and other things that mean you should have your head examined. But anyway, right? <laughs> that word marathon comes from the ancient world, and the, the, you know, the massive uh, Persian army was invading uh, Greece. They had been taking over the known world at the time, and they come to Marathon, and there they are met by a much smaller Greek army that is actually victorious over them in battle. And so the, the uh, winning general sends a, an evangelist, a, a runner, who runs the 26.2 miles or whatever it is from Marathon, I think it was to Athens, and he gets there and he announces the good news that the Persians have been defeated, that the Greek nation is preserved, and then he collapses and dies, which is exactly what would happen to me if I tried to run a marathon, right? Okay. So that proclamation is called an euangelion. It's the gospel, or the word we call gospel, English word for euangelion, gospel. It's a, God, it's a good proclamation. And so at the heart of the gospel, the evangelion is the kingdom of God. You see this with Jesus. You see it with the apostle Paul. At the end of his life, he's in Rome. He's living in house arrest, right? And the scriptures tell us he lived there for two whole years. He's waiting to go on trial before Caesar to, to appeal for his life. He lived there two whole years at his own expense. He welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. It's a very important word. And we are including it in our summer study as many people have just gotten turned upside down about this word kingdom. And it's led to wrong interpretations, implications, applications that have affected individuals, they've affected churches, they've affected nation states. So for example, through the years, there have been Christian groups who have tried to establish Christian communities and they refer to it as the kingdom of God on earth. They're gonna bring the reality, the kingdom of God into time and space. And those, those attempts oftentimes went completely off the rails with all kinds of abuses. There were nation states that pursued imperialism and colonialism, and they did it under the banner of the kingdom of God, bringing the heathen peoples into the kingdom of God and to justify the, the pillaging of other nations and other peoples. And then there's been theological systems that have come about, like dispensationalism, which probably most of us in this room have been exposed to in one way or another, if you've been a Christian for any length of time at all, which has taught Christians for decades that the kingdom of God is something that is way off in the future. That will happen after the church has been raptured from the planet and the tribulation occurs and that the, that the kingdom of God is all about the nation state of Israel and events concerning that nation. So there's been all kinds of confusions and it shouldn't surprise us because the Jews of Jesus' day were very confused, and they had a huge misunderstanding of the kingdom of God. Their understanding of the kingdom of God was rooted in the Old Testament, and it basically, they broke down human history into three sequential phases, right? They looked at everything that was happened and was going to happen, and they said it fits within these three phases. The first phase over here with the tree, and that's the, you know, that's the creation, the Garden of Eden. They recognized, and rightly so, that God created humanity. We were in the garden. We were given the responsibility to have dominion over the earth, to act as God's vice regents, uh, ruling, growing, and building God's kingdom. You know, in the, in the ancient days, when a, a king wanted to mark his territory, he would do so by putting up statues of his image. And you, you see these in museums, you know. And we have pictures of Nebuchadnezzar and Alexander the Great and all these great men of old. And they would put these all throughout their realm in order to remind everybody that this belongs to me, Alexander or 
Caesar or whatever. Caesar put his on the coin because the money went everywhere, his image. In, in the garden, we are told as ma male and female to be married, to have children. Why? In order to put the image of God all across the world to fill the earth up with his image. Why would he want the earth filled up with his image? Because the entire earth belongs to him. And that's his declaration of who's the owner of this earth, right? That's creation. Of course, we know what happens in the garden. Sin happens, and it's even in that garden that the second phase begins, redemption, right? And in the garden, God announced not only the consequences of humanity's sin, the pain, the suffering, the death that would come about because of this, he also announced the first promise, the first gospel, the first euangelion, the seed of the woman would come. We looked at this when we were going through the book of Genesis this last ministry year, right? This promise that one day God would send a deliverer who would bring about the redemption of everyone, of God's people, the sins of God's people, every one of them. And so that first promise is there in the book of Genesis and the story of the Old Testament is the unfolding of this first gospel promise that God, he unfolds it by making these covenants with humanity. And these covenants have blessings and stipulations attached to them. And each successive covenant further unfolds his plan to redeem his people, to put before his people how deeply he loves them and how much he is willing to forgive them for their sins. The true depth of God's love for his people, though, is actually revealed in how he responded when they continually broke those covenant promises. They, they would violate the promises they had made to God. They would experience consequences, but ultimately it got so bad in their rebellion and sin, the Israelites broke the covenant to such an extent that God declares, you're going to experience the consequences of all of these covenantal con uh, judgments and curses, and you're gonna be sent into exile into captivity in a foreign land. And you see this happen to the northern kingdom and then the southern kingdom. And through his prophets, he tells them that you are being punished and judged because you broke the covenant promises that you made to me. Sin is serious. And there's consequences to them. But it's through these same prophets that announce God's judgment that God announces that third phase what is called the eschaton, or the end, the, the establishment of the kingdom of God. It's through these very same prophets that God gives more good news. He promises that one day, despite their sinfulness, he will restore his people to the land. He will restore the entire earth. His king, his Messiah will come. He will pay for the sins of his people, establish the kingdom, rule, and restore this broken world to what it was meant to be. Of course, the Israelites are excited about this. The exile finally finishes. They return to the promised land. They rebuild the temple. They are ready for the kingdom to come and the Messiah to come. And he doesn't come. And he doesn't come. And he doesn't come. In fact, life in some respects gets even worse for the Israelites. Well, first of all, they, they go back to their old ways and they continue to rebel and disobey and reject God. But then they become like a pawn in the hands of one Gentile nation after another and conquered, conqueror after conqueror takes over. For 400 years, God is silent. So much so that the rabbis and the teachers begin to go back to their understanding of the Old Testament and of the kingdom. And they, they conclude, okay, we, we've got something maybe that we missed here. And, and over that 400-year period, by the time that Jesus comes along, the idea of the Messiah that who's going to come in the line of David is that he comes as a warrior king. You know, he's the ultimate Rambo who can take out all of the oppressors and the empires that are ruling them. And so when the Pharisees come to Jesus, the kingdom at this point has been morphed into a political entity. And the Messiah is a great warrior general who will kill everyone. In fact, some of them talk there'll be two Messiahs. There'll be the guy who has all the blood on his hands. And because he has so much blood on his hands, he can't then be the final Messiah because that needs to be a kinder, gentler person, right? 
So it was all, all about the politics of the day. And this is the focus of the Israelites and the Pharisees when they pose this question to Jesus in verse 20 in our text. And what's revealing is how Jesus answers this question. And as he answers this question in the way he does, he, he affirms the kingdom con- concept but then he absolutely turns the common beliefs that were held back then and even today, he just turns them on their head, turns them upside down. And he does it really in four very distinct ways in this passage. The four words, is he, he tells us something about the nature of the kingdom. He tells us something about the timing, the purpose, and how we participate in the kingdom of God in this passage, right? Let's start with the nature of the kingdom. Verse 20, being asked by the Pharisees, When the kingdom of God would come, he answered them, the kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed. The Pharisees, the Israelites of that day, they expected their Messiah to come, raise up the army, go to war, kick everyone out, establish his reign with the throne, with the crown on his head, everything right there in Jerusalem. It was a physical, very much a one-dimensional understanding of the kingdom of God. And what Jesus tells them in this passage is something very different, that the kingdom is first spiritual, something that you don't see before it ever becomes much of a physical reality. This is, this is what the Apostle Paul tells us also in the book of Colossians, chapter 1, verse 13. God has delivered us from the domain of darkness, from the kingdom of darkness, and he's transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Everything about The transferal from one kingdom to another is a spiritual reality. And so the nature of God's kingdom, first and foremost, especially as we are experiencing it today, is spiritual. How about the timing? Remember that image from the Israelites? There were three phases, and they were sequential. So creation happened, sin. Now redemption, that happened. We're in the redemption phase, they would view it. And in some point in the future, we'll come to kingdom phase. This is what dispensationalism teaches, what the system that I was raised in, for example, in both my church years and seminary years. This isn't what Jesus says, though. He says in verse 20, the kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed, nor will they say, look, here it is, or there, for behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. Why would Jesus say that the kingdom of God is in the midst of you? Well, very simply, Jesus was saying the kingdom is now walking among you and is here among you, Pharisees, because the king is here among you, Pharisees. And wherever the king is, that's where the kingdom is. And and that's significant because Jesus is saying that the kingdom of God began to appear here on earth 2,000 years ago in his first advent, that when he came the first time around, he inaugurated and began the kingdom of God here on earth. It's primarily spiritual right now. But one day, at the second coming of Christ, he is going to consummate that kingdom. And man, when he does, it will definitely be a physical reality at that point in time as he takes over everything. So we, we understand what Jesus is saying here, and, and we actually experience it ourselves. It's, it's that idea of the already but not yet, right? We've already been saved, but we're not yet fully saved, right? Uh, in God's eyes, we're already sanctified, but we're not, we're not completely fu- fully sanctified and made holy. So the the work of God has begun in us. It's already happened. We're already the children of God. But the ultimate expression and consummation of our salvation, we have not yet experienced it. We are living in the between the already and the not yet. That's where we all live. And that's where the kingdom of God is. It's already been established and inaugurated, but it's not yet fulfilled and consummated. And that's why as we pray the Lord's Prayer, we pray what? Thy kingdom come. Oh, is it? No, no. Yeah, exactly. It has come and it is coming. And one day it will fully arrive. J.I. Packer writes that the kingdom is present in its beginnings, though future in its fullness. In one sense, it is here already, but in the richest sense, it is still to come. Church, this principle is huge. And we're going to see it in just a moment. We're going to revisit it when we get into some personal application. 
Third thing about this reframing of the kingdom is the purpose of the kingdom. He says in verse 22 to the disciples, the days are coming when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not see it. And they will say to you, look there or look here. Do not go out or follow them. For as the lightning flashes and lights up the sky from one side to the other, so will the Son of Man be in his day. Already, Jesus is laying the groundwork for a shocking revelation to the disciples. That there is coming a time shortly when he will no longer be among them. That they will long to see him and have, them, have him with them, but he will not be there. And in that revelation, he does something and he says something that's very important. He, he designates himself and he refers to himself as the son of man. And this son of man designation gives us a clue as to what the purpose of the kingdom of God is all about and what the Messiah is all about. It, it, that, that phrase, the Son of Man, remember I mentioned prophets, Isaiah, you know, and Jeremiah, Daniel earlier that were used by God. Daniel, in Daniel chapter 7, has a vision. And he says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a Son of Man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given, and to the Son of Man was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. This gives us a clue as to the purpose of the kingdom of God. And might I suggest that any purpose that is about the restoration of a nation state is too small in its scope and vision. Because the Son of Man didn't come to restore a nation state. The Son of Man has come to restore the entire cosmos. The Son of Man has come to restore a people, all peoples, nations, and languages across the planet that would become part of his kingdom. That's the purpose of Jesus coming as Messiah. And you see this promise and this vision fulfilled in the book of Revelation. In the book of Revelation, at the end of time, we're given this vision of the king sitting on the throne and there before him are people from every nation, every language, every tribe, every people group, everyone from across this planet represented and a number of them that is so great that a human can't count them. That is what the king is up to. Much more than a little nation one little nation, his scope is cosmic in scale. How about participation? Jesus even turns this upside down for the Pharisees. You see, the Pharisees believed that their participation in the kingdom of God and their entry and citizenship in the kingdom of God was essentially given to them because of the, the quality of their life. They were good people who obeyed the law who did the right things and didn't do the wrong things. And as a result, they are rewarded with eternal life and membership in the kingdom of God. But Jesus says, nah, -uh, not at all. In verse 32, he says, remember Lot's wife. Whoever seeks to preserve his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life will keep it. I tell you, in that night, there will be two in one bed, one will be taken and the other left. There will be two women grinding together. One will be taken and the other left. Do you, do you see the significance of what he's saying here? We, we don't become a citizen of the kingdom of God by following the path of human works and self-righteousness and performance like the Pharisees. We become a citizens of God's kingdom through repentance and trusting in Jesus as Lord and Savior. Repentance is here when you think of Lot's wife. You know the story of Sodom and Gomorrah? Sodom and Gomorrah, these wicked cities that were involved in all kinds of sinful immorality and behavior, and, and they really represented wealth and all the vice that comes with society. And here's Lot and his family that are living there, Abraham's nephew. And Lot is warned by God that God is going to judge these cities for their sin and destroy them completely. And and told him to get out of town, take his wife and his family, and, and he does, but his wife, 
her love for that city, her love and allegiance to that way of life and the sin and the freedom, so-called freedom that she had to live however she wanted to live in that society as it was defined. It was so important to her that as she's fleeing, she disobeys God and she looks back with longing at what she was leaving behind, which shows she, you know, her feet may have been moving, but her heart was back there in the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah. And as a result, God judges her severely and immediately, and she's turned into this pillar of salt. And so the message here for us is simply Jesus saying, I am the son of man. And it's going to be like the days of Noah. People are going to be going around and they're going to be living their lives, marrying, giving in marriage, making money, going on vacations, grinding flour down at the mill, lying in bed, sleeping, and then I am going to come back. And when I come back, if you are Lot, like, like, if you are like Lot's wife, and you're, the allegiance of your heart is with this world, if you're living for yourself, following your sin, living the way you want to live, understand you will be taken in that moment and cast into eternal judgment, just as Lot's wife was judged. So Jesus is actually giving us a very gracious warning here and an encouragement here. He's telling us all that to participate in the kingdom of God, there is a choice that has to be made. We either choose to be like Lot's wife and look back and continue to have our allegiance with the things of this world and the way we want to live life and with sin and being masters of our own domain and living in that way, or we lose our life. We give up that life. We turn from it. We repent from it. We turn, we lose that life, and we give our allegiance to Jesus, and we trust in Christ as our Lord. We're no longer Lord. He's now Lord of our lives. That decision is what determines, will you be a participant in the kingdom of God or not? If you've yet to make that commitment to Christ, I would encourage you this morning, do so. The destiny of your eternal soul hangs in the balance, and we never know, as Jesus is warning, when that final day will come when he returns in might and glory. Well, all right. How does that and what Jesus says about the kingdom influence us, impact us in daily lives? How about the ministry of our church? How does it, how does it change and influence and direct us as a church and as individuals? Well, this idea that Jesus is really communicating in this passage, that he's the son of man, he is the one true king. And what is he doing He is building his kingdom in heaven. He's building his kingdom on earth. And the way he's building it is in and through his disciples. This idea right here, this basic understanding of the kingdom of God has incredible implications to all of us. How we invest our lives, how we live on the job how we raise our children, how we spend our money, how we invest our talents and abilities, as a church, how we do ministry. For example, the the mission of our church, right? We're about bringing gospel restoration to people's deepest needs and our broken world. It is built upon this idea that Jesus is going to restore people's lives. He's going to build his kingdom in us and in other people who are broken by sin. And he's going to do that through the gospel message and the power that only comes through Jesus Christ, right? This is intrinsic to our mission as a church. It has implications and applications for us as individuals. It means that when Paul says that Jesus has given to us the ministry of reconciliation, that we are to be ambassadors for Christ, that what that means is that Jesus is going to work through us to bring other people into the kingdom of God. This is part of our calling as, you ready for the word? Evangelist. And we don't have to run 26.2 miles to do it, right? We're all evangelists. We are all bearers of the evangelion, the good news. Every one of us are proclaimers of the good news. If you've experienced it, you're a proclaimer of it. And we have the joy 
of being used by God in this way. Every one of us have people in our lives needing to be reconciled to God. And God would have us to bear witness, to testify to what Jesus has done in our lives, to bring the good news to those who we work with that we are raising as children and influencing them so that they can see their need for Christ and that he's their only hope for salvation. Israel expected a warrior king. Can I just plant here for a moment that God's kingdom is not built through us if our tactics are the tactics of anger and violence or military might or force or, uh, you know, all the, this the junk that we see, the divisiveness that's going on in our world today. God builds his kingdom through Christians who are loving other people, both inside the church and outside the church, with the grace that we have been loved with. And so, church, the kingdom, the kingdom is not built like this, okay? We've seen this over and over again, and, and Christians and even churches, I mean, this is a church group who's adopted the tactics of the outrage culture to, to tell the people of their need to repent. Jesus didn't walk around with protest signs. I, I mean, Jesus was living in a system that was I mean, it's much worse than our system. Jesus' focus was not on replacing Pontius Pilate with, the, with a candidate of his liking. His focus was not on building up the nation of Israel and making sure it was strong and secure and the best in the world. None of that was Jesus' focus. And his tactics were not political tactics. And it certainly wasn't the tactics of our outrage culture that's around today. Honestly, I, I don't think we would ever have seen Jesus use Facebook the way many Christians use Facebook or Instagram. And church, we're hurting the kingdom by how we make use of these things. The kingdom is not built through protesting. It's not built through propagating political positions or social issue positions through social media. It's first built by us living out Jesus' love and the grace of the gospel, first and foremost, by us bringing gospel restoration to one another. Because every one of us in this room, as part of the family of God and part of Covenant Church, we too are all broken by sin. We need restoration that can only come to the gospel. This is why people are serving back in Covenant Cove even this morning, because these beautiful little children are stinking rotten sinners. <laughs> right? And they need Jesus. And so when we bring gospel restoration, we're starting first with one another. We're starting with our children and our youth. We're starting by involving ourselves in each other's lives because we're broken by sin and it's only through the gospel and power of Jesus Christ that we're ever gonna be sanctified and transformed in the image of Christ. And remember this, as we come into the season where we you know, are, are encouraging you to get involved in biblical community and get involved in small groups where we can grow together. Understand that it's in these environments with one another that God, that Jesus is working in us for our benefit. He grows us in this environment, but he's also working through us for the benefit of other people who are in that group because we mature and we grow as Christians in biblical community with one another. He's growing the kingdom in us and he's restoring the world through us as we live in biblical community together, as we worship together like we have this morning, where we've already had just a little taste of what we're going to get for all of eternity. You know? I mean, as awesome as that song would be, I praise him, thank you, that song was wonderful that y'all brought to us this morning. And as awesome as that song is, that's only a little shadow of what we have for all of eternity. Okay? And so God strengthened us this way. You know, church, one final thought. The kingdom, the, the growth of the kingdom is it's contrary to human methods and human expectations, right? 
You pull this lever and you do this, A plus B, you get C, right? It's not mechanistic and it's not automatic like that at all. The, the kingdom's growth is actually not always obvious. In fact, sometimes it's not obvious. You can't even see it. It's so gradual at times that you think, oh, okay, God's moved on. I mean, who of us in here, I think probably many of us, have someone that we know that we may have prayed for for years to come to Jesus Christ. And it maybe got to a point where we just basically in our hearts and minds, we gave up. Okay, it's no use. Now we might still pray for him because we know we should, but honestly, we didn't have a whole lot of hope about that person. Little did we know that God was at work in that person's life in small ways and brings them to faith, sometimes at the very last hour of this life. Do you remember the parables of Jesus? Earlier in Luke, the, the mustard seed and the, the, the leavened bread, you know, the mustard seed's a tiny, tiny little seed. And when you plant it, it flourishes into this massive tree that gives incredible shade and, and plenty of leaves and branches and places for birds to, to build nests. And then you have the, the dough, right? The big ball of dough. What happens when you put just a little bit of yeast, just a tiny amount of yeast in that dough? And you let it have some time. What happens? The entire structure and nature of that lump of dough is changed because that little bit of yeast begins to grow and grow and spread and spread. And pretty soon it saturates and it takes over the entire lump of dough. And that's what Jesus says the kingdom is like. He says the kingdom is just like that yeast. It's just like that little mustard seed. It's going to grow slowly. Sometimes you can't even see what's happening, but mark it down. It is growing and it's ultimately going to saturate the whole world. Do you ever wonder why Jesus gives his disciples those illustrations? I think it's because in part he knew that the disciples, like many of us, we're going we're gonna to face difficult times. They're going to face persecution. They'll face any number of difficult situations. And so Jesus is encouraging them. He knows they're going to face opposition. He knows that we're going to grow discouraged. And he's saying to this, don't lose heart. Don't worry. Don't grow weary in well-doing. We're going to face obstacles. We will experience times where it seems like our setbacks within the kingdom are greater than any successes that we've even had. And then we'll be involved in situations where, where God's math and our math are not the same thing at all, right? And he gives us this to encourage us because the word tells us Jesus is reigning right now in heaven at the right hand of the Father. And God is in the process and it's a gradual process that sometimes we don't see, sometimes we do see it in the miracle, all of a sudden, boom, and God does something. The person who we never thought would come to Christ, boom, are you kidding me? Didn't see that coming. But this is how God works. He's in the process of defeating every single enemy, every single stronghold and holdout to Jesus' reign. And one day, that last enemy, is going to be defeated. Stand with me, if you will, as we close out. Stand. That last enemy is referred to by Paul in 1 Corinthians 15. And he's talking to a church that in some respects, they were facing overwhelming obstacles. And it would be natural for them to wonder, is there any hope at all for us to, to, to fulfill what God wants in us for the kingdom of God? And so Paul tells them, listen, Keep your eyes on Christ because one day he's going to come back. He inaugurated it the first time. The second time he's going to consummate it. And when he does, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, everything will be changed. This world will be made new. The mortal bodies we have will be cast off and we will be raised in immortality. And the last enemies, sin and death will be defeated. That is how the kingdom plays out, church. That's what will happen. And so Paul tells the Corinthian church, in light of all of that, the opposition, the setbacks, the difficulties that you experience as God works in you and through you for his kingdom, remember this one thing and let's read it out loud together. Ready? Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. As we gear up for this ministry year, 
even in a normal ministry year, and this ain't gonna be a normal ministry year, and we're gonna have difficulties and challenges, that, that things that just have never happened in 40 years of this church since we were last a church plant. Remember this verse right here, that God is at work in us and through us. He's stead, so be steadfast, be unmovable, and know that everything that we're doing for his glory will bring about that fruit that he has ordained. Lord Jesus, thank you for working in us in this way. Thank you for building your kingdom in us. And Lord, as your people, we thank you for what has already happened in our lives. But Lord Jesus, we ask for everything that has not yet happened in our lives that you would make it so. Would you give us that power that we need to live for you and give us those people in our lives that you intend to bring into the kingdom and help us to see them and to pray for them and to reach out to them with your, the good news of Jesus Christ in both word and deed. And Lord, as a church, as we go through this time of transition this year, it's a big time of transition, will you help us to keep our eyes on the main thing, which is we are here as your kingdom people and you are working in us and through us and you're going to do something great for your glory through Covenant Church this year and in the years ahead. Help us to hold fast in faith to what you are doing and what you promise. In your name we pray, Jesus, amen.